Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this session in the middle of uh, this very important COP23. The subject matter of the session, as uh, you might see from the, the flyer, is uh, capacity development uh, for energy policy and sustainable development alternatives. Uh, the basic idea that of this uh, session is to discuss uh, and get your feedback on a number of issues that uh, have been covering uh, by several UN agencies in, in the task of supporting countries to formulate coherent and integrated sustainable development policies, be those for national development plans, for a 2030 agenda, a sustainable development goals, or for nationally determined commitments to the Paris Agreement. Uh, the, the panel that uh, we have today, it's a, it's a really uh, a dream panel. Uh, it's uh, composed of uh, Mark Howells, uh, Director of the Division of Energy Systems Analysis at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, by Tobias Fox, Head of the Department of Climate and Environment Consultancy. Uh, this is in German, Deutscher Westdienst Germany, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> and um, uh, better try in that remaining silent. And uh, Simon Langa, uh, Director of Water Program and the Water Futures and Solutions Initiative of the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IASA. And Maria Amparo Martinez Arroyo, a General Director of the National Institute of Ecology and Climate Change. Uh, with this uh, distinguished panel, we are going to try to address uh, a number of questions that uh, uh, UN agencies in their everyday support to countries on sustainable development are facing. Uh, these, uh, these questions have to do with the almost ubiquitous uh, demand of support to create capacity in countries to do uh, substantive analytical uh, work to support policy formulation. The, there are many possibilities in this regard, but the one that we are talking about uh, today is using uh, analytical tools in the form of quantitative models, and more specifically, in the form of integrated systems analysis models that, uh, that are very important to tackle uh, different tasks uh, that have multiple impacts and at the same that being integrated, they, re they need to remain sector relevant. This involves as well uh, institutional challenges and involves as well communications challenges. It's not enough to do the modeling. You have to be able to communicate so it can effectively serve the needs of policy decision makers. These are some of the challenges, some of the issues that the distinguished panel is going to address today. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn the microphone uh, to Mark Howells, who I already introduced. Um, Mark, please. Very good. I'll... Okay, good. Um, when Eduardo started and he said that we have a, a, a dream panel, I hope that doesn't mean that we're going to send you to sleep and you're going to start dreaming. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. But one of the things that we want to uh, focus on to start with is just to think about development 
in a slightly more nuanced way than uh, we often have. In uh, the first slide that I have on my presentation that is coming up now, uh, you will see an introduction. <laughs> and then you'll see this particular picture over here. This is a mapping of how the sustainable development goals influence each other. If we want to focus on one sustainable development goal, it, it, it impacts others. And it does this through a number of different ways. One way is the fact that the resource systems that uh, uh, all of these things are based on are interlinked. So for example, in this diagram you see here, we have a, a little box representing climate at the top, energy in the middle, uh, water on the right hand side, land on the left, and the socio-economy on the bottom. Now I want to just confess and say I'm an energy engineer, which is probably why energy appears in the middle there. But uh, you can move those around to whatever the focus is. And typically it's one of the things that we're trying to encourage ministries to, to do, to understand the linkages between these different systems. Now unfortunately you probably can't read this because um, the, uh, the slide is quite detailed and small. But essentially, what we've been working on, together with uh, other UN agencies and academic institutions and organizations, is to develop some very simple tools, some quantitative tools that help policymakers go beyond just saying, okay, we know there are interlinkages with other sectors, but to define those interlinkages. So, for example, in this picture here, we see climate at the top. Uh, if it rains nicely, we have uh, a lot of water coming into the system. That means that we can generate hydroelectricity, we can cool our thermal power plants. Some of that water is going to go around and uh, land on the land where we're uh, growing crops and so on. And uh, we see this, this interlinkage. But just imagine for a second that uh, the climate changes and we move into a drier climate. That means less water, less hydropower generation. Uh, we can't cool our thermal power plants as well as we would like to. It also means that we're going to have less water going directly to the, to the crops from runoff, which may mean that we have to start pumping water from groundwater reservoirs, which we can quantify and calculate. And that in turn is going to require more energy, but at a time when the energy that we have available is scarce. So how do we... Uh, how do we work with this and how do, how do we apply this? Uh, I want to take one little example. This is a, a picture of a pumping system in Punjab in India. Now India uh, supplies a large proportion of the food for something like 200 million poor Indians from 2% of the land in this particular uh, province. And in order to subsidize, in order to help the farmers produce uh, the crops, what the government does is it uh, provides free electricity. Now, the background is, is that India is a country with a strained electricity grid. Uh, the grid is based on fossil fuels, so some hydro, large amounts of coal, and so on. And by providing farmers with free electricity, they can do their pumping for free, and therefore they can grow a lot of different, different crops. This creates problems, because the pumping is free. They use much more water than is necessary for the crops that they're producing. It means over time, the groundwater table is reducing, which means that they have to put much more electricity uh, into, that, into that pumping. Okay? Uh, bear in mind that something like 20% of India's electricity bill all goes towards pumping water and maintaining the agricultural system. Now, by looking at this in an integrated way, we, what we want are crops output, crop outputs on the end. If we start to think about having more efficient irrigation systems, maybe changing crops and so on, we drastically reduce the amount of water that we need to pump, if we need to pump any water. In turn, we reduce the amount of electricity that needs to be generated. In turn, we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that are required. And so an intervention in the agricultural sector, which can be clearly tracked and quantified, may have a very large impact in terms of greenhouse gas mitigation. Low cost and something that would be um, profitable to the economy as a whole. So if we take this clues resource system, the climate, land, energy, water, and then map to the, the socio-economy, we can do some fairly transparent mapping to the sustainable development goals as a start. How do we implement this? Well, we started to uh, put together some very simple analytical frameworks implemented in several countries uh, in projects led by UNDESA and the UNDP and the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. And um, 
just provided a simple toolkit that develops a simple land use model, water model, energy model, um, uh, aspects to do with the climate and so on. And this toolkit is open source. So if you want to make it more complicated uh, to address peculiarities in the country that you're working in, that can be uh, that can be done. We're also developing um, online teaching and training materials so that uh, folks in different places can start to develop curricula and put this kind of thing together. Now, on the one hand, we have something simple. Uh, on the other, it's clearly the case that we still need to develop a lot of new science. So every year, uh, organized by Cambridge University, IASA, and ourselves, uh, we have a special session at a, at a large European geos, uh, geosciences conference. We have special issues of journals that people are invited to uh, submit articles to. We've had articles published in nature journals. And we're developing um, a community of practice. We called it Optimus. Um, uh, everybody uh, below a certain age thre threshold is going to have an association with that that is maybe not intended. Uh, but this Optimus is, is um, an abbreviation for Open Tools, Integrated Modeling and Upskilling for Sustainable Development. And by trying to pull the best-in-class academic uh, organizations together to help improve the science, uh, to create a community amongst decision makers and international organizations, and a community amongst uh, model builders and analysts, we think it would be possible to, uh, to help take the science policy interface further on a lot of different, on a lot of different fronts. Uh, with that, I'd like to um, end off with, with, with the following thoughts. Our resources are limited. The resource systems that we have are intertwined. Our demands for the resources and the services that they provide are growing. They're going to be exacerbated by climate change. Unless we untangle the thoughts and untangle the systems that are intertwined in a way that we can manage them, there will be shortages in the future. This will result, as it has done in the past, in conflicts. However, if we develop new science, new policy, new technologies, there is a huge opportunity, huge market opportunities, huge opportunities to uh, develop intelligent interventions in one place that affect development elsewhere. And I think that's an incredibly exciting challenge. And it's a privilege to be a part of this, this panel and this team as we and you address those. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, I'm, I'm not going to summarize at all. Uh, just going to go to the next uh, speaker, um, Tobias Fox, please. So can switch to the next slide, or is it? Well, I could introduce, I'm a, f a meteorologist also, <laughs> so I bring you to the science, to the weather and climate science, which is the source, of course, the main information source for uh, renewable energy production. You need to know about the weather and the climate. And I will explain you a little bit more about an activity which has been started already in 2009, which is called Global Framework for Climate Services as it was already introduced, very, very important that we know how the climate is, the, the variability, but also is, is changing because it impacts our energy production. And so also we need to take uh, this into account in order to, to uh, formulate our policies and, and adjust our policies. So this activity is a UN initiative, um, GFCS, Global Framework for Climate Services, which is an intergovernmental partnership, it is, it is led by the World Meteorological Organization, so the organization in which all meteorological services, weather services of the world are organized, jointly organized. But it's closely connected also with other UN agencies that are cooperating with that, so like the uh, World Health Organization, the World Food Program, the UNESCO, and the FAO, Food and Agricultural Organization, and many others. And it looks into um, the, the development of reliable science-based information in order to support adaptation to climate change, in order to feed into uh, planning, policy, practice, and on different scales. And on the next slide, you see a bit better than how energy and metallurgy are interlinked, as I already explained uh, in the introduction. There's different timescales 
in which weather phenomenon occur, and I think you all know them from your all experience, like thunderstorms, like passing clouds, like hurricanes also, on the longer term also drought. We have sometimes a lot of water, which is good. On the other hand, we have also the, the, the negative side of the medal, where we have uh, not enough water, and, and, and this is of course affects also the hydropower generation in, 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 in a large scale sometimes and leads also then in, in countries which uh, I rely, rely on the hydropower then also to, to blackouts and so some really energy, energy problems also. And so we need to know best how this climate phenomenon occur, when they occur, how strong they will be in order to prepare and in order to defeat in other energy sources at, at that time. And, so, and then we also on the, on the longer time scale then to the right you see also then the, the impact of El Nino, also well known I think now in the community and also on the long-term climate change, which is the, a very big problem. And of course also then the, the, the weather services come into place as the information source then for the best informa uh, yeah, information and, and then in order to feed the policy uh, to adapt and mitigate to the climate impacts and to manage uh, the, the risks also, also in that context. Some examples already mentioned that renewable energy production is highly dependent on, on climate. There's three components which I would like to introduce. One is the wind energy production. Here we have the, the wind speed and the wind direction, which is, as you know, it's weather-based, of course. And so we need to know in, in a very high quality also then uh, how the, the wind direction and speed is changing in order then to feed our, our turb turbines then to produce the, the wind power. We have the solar uh, energy production, so the photovoltaic energy. Here you also, we need to know when the, the sun is shining, when there not, is not enough sun radiation, when there are clouds, because this also impacts then um, the, the energy production and leads to, to crisis and also sometimes to, to blackout and to, to real problems. And the, the, the one to the bottom is well known, already mentioned, is the, the hydro energy. Here we need to know on the one side, when there is too much precipitation, because then this could also cause, cause problem, problems, but on the other side also, when there is um, not enough precipitation, when we have long-term drought, in order then to, to, to switch to other energy uh, production forms. So what we need to do and what we are addressing in context of GFCS, this uh, activity I'm introducing, is the platform on, on energy. So we look for into to strengthen the, the resilience on, on climate change on impacts on, on energy and to, to support adaptation activities across different sectors. We look into the, the efficiency also and the, the, the reduction of, the, of, the, uh, of energy consumption in relation to the, to the energy uh, production, so all those, those mitigation aspects which are very important. And uh, the second one is the economical aspect, which is also very important. Energy production is highly economical also, so it's a business, and it can lead also to additional growth, to additional um, um, business opportunities. And this is uh, also very important then to take into account, so this, this is also a very positive impact and to address it in, in, in a most optimum way. So at the end, we need to have a mix of different renewable energy and um, depending on the different resources in the different regions and, and, and countries, and that's where the MET services are for, the meteorological and the climate services, in order to inform them what to, what to expect and what best to use. The final slide is an, a new intro, uh, introduction to a new activity we are just preparing. This is called Global Climate Services for Energy, where we want to provide on the long term, this is a five-year project which will start very soon, uh, the development of, of climate-based products to advise operators, planners and decision makers to improve investment decisions. And at the, at the final ultimate goal is to have a safe, a reliable and a, and a cleaner energy supply. And uh, triggered by that also, of course, then more jobs and a, and a better and improved market also for commercial climate services. This is a joint activity, or it will be when it, when it will be running, of the World Meteorological Organization with different other institutions, like the World Energy and Meteorology Council, like the International Energy Agency, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the International Renewable Energy Agency, and the World Bank Energy Sector Management Assistance Program. We will 
plan to target four different countries, also in different climate regions. So it might be uh, Moldova in Europe, Tanzania in, in Africa, Colombia in South America, and PNG in, in Oceania. And I think it can be a very positive example how the UN system can join forces to scale up capacity de development in different regions and countries in support of the energy sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, Simon, please. Is the slide coming? Yeah? What do I press? Anyway, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Simon Langen. I'm from IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And I'd like to talk to you in the next five minutes to try and start a discussion on what do we mean by water, energy, and land, and building on what Mark and Tobias have already said. How do we take those forward? So this is a project that we're undertaking with UNIDA as implementing partners, and it's funded by the Global Environment Facility for the next three years. And just to share some thoughts of what, what are we trying to do under that, and particularly about what I call capacity enhancement and partnerships. It's not building capacity, capacity is there, it's with you, it's with us, and it's how do we work together in, in deeper partnerships than we've been able to in the past. And the five key messages I really want to, you to take home are really summarized here. How can we provide evidence to support policy, its implementation, investors, and those stakeholders who have to make those decisions and make those changes to their practice? How can we move away from siloed approaches and thinking to a more systematic viewpoint? How can we think transdisciplinary and work transdisciplinary? So researchers not working by themselves, policymakers not by working by themselves, investors and stakeholders. But what is the framework? And really that leads into the fifth point, which is about uh, communication. So I'll just share about half a dozen slides of how I think that might uh, work. So okay, here are two frameworks. We're here largely to talk about the one on the left, you know, COP21, and how do we, how do we meet that? two degree change. So we could look at this idea of shared socioeconomic pathways. But at the same time, we have the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. How are we going to meet those? One and two, poverty and hunger. But hang on a minute, what about six, water, seven, energy? How does it all fit together? And what are our trade-offs? What are the synergies in trying to meet those? So I think you could say well, we're very good at the diagnostics. We know where we are. We've got now got these targets of where we're trying to get to by 2030. But how are countries, and indeed regions, going to meet that? What are the pathways? And really, it's that pathways. And how do you get that? And again, you can't do that by a siloed or individual approach. So in terms of a focus, well, you could look at some underpinning drivers. What's happening here? And so if we look at Africa, for example, a doubling of the population, and moving from a, a, a very poverty-stricken uh, region to a region which is more prosperous. And then if we change and look at Asia, okay, so there we're starting, we've still got a large increase in population, but look at that socioeconomic development portrayed by GDP. So it's this idea of taking the biophysical along with socioeconomic. So trying to incorporate all this transdisciplinary uh, approach and interdisciplinary approach. So next thing, here we are, and typically if you go to university, you may go to uh, a Department of Agriculture or a Department of Energy or a Department of, of Environment. If you're in a ministry, you might work in a Ministry of Agriculture. So how can we tie these up? And these, if you like, are our stocks. But look at those arrows between them, and it's the flows. And it's these flows which we need to try and manage and think about in terms of where our future is, how we're going to get there. And not within a country, the SDGs are the responsibility of individual states. But what happens when you've got a shared resource? And I come from a water background, so I obviously think about shared groundwaters, transboundary groundwaters, and indeed uh, transboundary uh, rivers. So we can use our range of integrated assessment models. Some of you may know Globium, EPIC, the message model, and our recently uh, released community water model. So we can look, put those together. We can use a range of indicators. So the three maps there show you 
uh, hotspots in terms of the individual sectors of water, energy, and land, and they're underpinned by 16 key indicators. So this paper will come out as the IPCC report in the IPCC report, and as well as being submitted to environmental research letters. And then we can combine those to look at global hotspots. So where are there opportunities? Where are the constraints in water, energy, and land? And how can we put those together? So that's fine at the global scale, but actually let's go to the next scale, uh, which is these regions. So what we're trying to do is work with UNIDA and Jeff to sort of say, let's build a framework where we could operationalize this at the regional scale. And here it's very important, if you think about in this case, we're using the Indus uh, and the Zambezi. What happens if the upstream countries, such as Angola, China, make some decisions about how they're going to use the water? They could put in a dam, either for hydropower or irrigation or multiple use of it. What happens downstream? What is left in terms of resources? What is the, the uh, opportunities for synergies and trades within those regions in terms of energy, in terms of food and water? So how can you put that uh, together? And equally for the Zambezi, how could you put that uh, together? So what if, what if I want to hit energy security? What if I want to hit food security when you've got this shared resource uh, running across these transboundary regions? So can we provide a tool where we can explore those synergies uh, and trade-offs? And of course, nobody's mentioned yet, this is set within the sustainability agenda. So we have to leave enough resources, land resources of good quality, water resources of good quality to support the environment. So the idea of environmental flows and the, the idea of, of restoration of degraded land. So again, how can we put that together uh, to meet the SDGs uh, in, the, in the future? So I hope that's given uh, a, a few uh, crumbs for thought that we can uh, develop uh, over the discussion. So thank you very much. Now, uh, give the floor to Amparo. Thank you very much for, uh, to the organizers for the invitation. Um, I, before I, I present uh, some of our experience with the, with the CLUE model, I want to say some words about the, the uh, institutional framework to face with climate change in, in Mexico, and that is why we are so interested and so participating in that in this in, in this project. Uh, the, from the law of climate change in Mexico in 2012, uh, we have a, an, an organization of of the um, government, federal government, and at, at the national level also that has a. Uh, the participation of all the ministries in an in a interministerial commission uh, at a, with the Congress uh, participation uh, also and at all the levels, uh, national, uh, subnational and local levels has uh, the same, the same uh, framework. And uh, the National uh, Institute for Ecology and Climate Change is on charge of integrating and generating, uh, uh, even of evaluating all the information about climate change uh, around the country and to make proposals for uh, public policies. Uh, then, when I say that, uh, when, when we knew that the, the, the proposal of clues that my colleagues are already uh, shown, uh, we we uh, spoke with all the sectors related to uh, to to create uh, some uh, some uh, um, exercise about the the models that uh, conduct us to to make uh, more proposals of planning of the public policies. Uh, then we the, we uh, select in the first time uh, the young. Uh, official uh, official uh, uh, public, uh, how you say, uh, funcionarios públicos? Uh, government officials. Government officials, <laughs> yes. Uh, we, 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 we select uh, some of them and uh, they were to, uh, to an exercise, a training 
about the, this, uh, all, all these uh, goals of the model of CLIUS with uh, some uh, scenarios. And uh, well, of course, uh, we, we had to, to choose also the good questions. Uh, as, uh, as everybody here uh, know, if uh, you have the, the good questions, you, have, you, have the, you could have uh, some good answers. Uh, answers. And, and then uh, in, the, in that uh, training sessions, uh, we, we made uh, some, uh, some uh, questions about uh, how uh, can, can we uh, look the, the relationship and the, uh, the state of some of the agricultural land, energy, and climate uh, together, putting some of the, of the basic but uh, well-informed parameters that, that we had about that, that items in the, in the country. Then uh, we asked also how uh, we can uh, enhance our NDC's goals, how, how we can uh, enhance our ambition in the next NDC goals that uh, already are, are ambitious. We have 22 a percent of reduction of, of um, a GSG, uh, but uh, we we uh, prove here, we we test here how uh, we can we can look in some scenarios uh, or or indices. And uh, then with the, with this uh, uh, training. We are now working um, also and sharing with uh, the institutions that are in charge of energy, of agriculture, of uh, uh, water, and of, uh, about the environment. Uh, what uh, what are the the, the uh, some of the uh, cases or the studies when we can apply the clues? And now we are working on uh, a based on that training in uh, another case study that is involving all the uh, metropolitan uh, areas, uh, it's a megalopolis that are uh, from seven states that are uh, together in the same uh, area. Uh, and uh, we, are, we are trying, uh, th there is a very important zone for us and uh, we, we select uh, this, this area to make the, the case study because it's an, an area that has a, a, a relevant a percentage of the inhabitants, but also because it's the area where we have better information, better data, because uh, there are uh, another, another regions of the country that, ha uh, that uh, have not so uh, good data. And then we are working on, on that. Uh, then we are now applying all the the CLIU uh, the CLIU uh, program with uh, taking taking as a, as a basis the the basins, not uh, not only the, the 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 territory of each city, but the uh, the basins with all the uh, information about the uh, air quality of, uh, and about all that all that things. Then where the challenges and opportunities that we have is inter uh, integrative uh, planning of national and subnational goals, uh, building the uh, synergies among the sectors that I mentioned, and uh, coordinated actions to reach the objectives of Paris Agreement, SDGs, and, and other conventions like uh, biodiversity, like uh, uh, desertification, and, and many others. We think that this uh, could allow us to make a, a planning more uh, integrative and taking into account all, uh, all the goals that we are, are uh, trying to reach. Thank you very much. Hello, okay. Thank you very much, Amparo. Uh, well, we have had a, a very a fast and uh, but widely covering a session which, uh, in which we have uh, heard about 
integrated uh, analysis and modeling using clues uh, in countries. Uh, we have also heard uh, specifically of climate, uh, climate change services, and that applies to four, uh, or four countries, Tanzania, Colombia, PNG, and Moldova. Uh, we heard about uh, the important work of YASA, that is uh, after, I would say, a uh, highly uh, distinguished uh, uh, record of global modeling and regional modeling. Now they are looking, zooming down into two important river basins, Embassy and Indus. And then we also heard from uh, one of the country uh, projects in which I, I really uh, I really accept the idea of a capacity enhancement. Uh, we call it more than clients, we call them partners because we are really, I don't know who is the client of who, right? Uh, so that's a case of Mexico in which uh, uh, the, the point that I want to highlight is not only the integrated part, but the subnational part, which is the need to go even beyond or further down uh, the country scale. We have uh, then, we mentioned about uh, four, uh, perhaps three times two, six, ten countries, plus about eight countries that uh, the UN together with KTH and other partners are covering with a capacity development, that's the official name, the capacity development projects on modeling tools. Uh, those countries include, if the memory doesn't fail me, uh, well, Mexico, uh, um, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Paraguay partially in Latin America. It includes or is about to include uh, Ghana, Uganda, uh, Senegal, Cameroon, um, uh, Ethiopia, uh, and Ethiopia in, in Africa and in, in the Asia region, Vietnam and um, Mongolia. Oh, that's, that sounds like a wide coverage, but still far, far, far from what is needed. Uh, so the question of scaling up really becomes an issue. And so I open the floor with this uh, uh, to the to questions and perhaps having some feedback from the uh, from our panelists. Uh, so the floor is open. Yes, the microphone. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Raksha Thapa and I'm the energy and climate specialist from UNICEF. Thank you so very much for the excellent round of presentations. Um, really enjoyed um, the, the deliberations. I have my question for the first speaker. Sorry, I missed your um, introductions. Um, you mentioned that um, one of the activities that you are undertaking is also working on educational materials and advisory, right? So if you co could elucidate a little bit more and let us know what exactly you're doing, because as um, you all are aware that UNICEF also works on um, education, and increasingly we have been looking into incorporating sustainable energy and climate mitigation actions into our core areas education being one of them. So it would be excellent for us also to know what are the areas you're looking at and if there are any opportunities where we can join hands together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other question? Yes. Hi. Voy a hacerla en español ya que me van a entender un poco y si le puedo traducir les ayudaría porque mi inglés no está tan bueno. Eh, represento a la, a la Corporación Nacional de Electricidad de mi país, de Ecuador, y estamos tratando de buscar eh, la eficiencia energética y 
y, eh, implementarla y mejorarla de lo que habíamos empezado en un inicio. Entonces, okay. mi pregunta... Uh, she represents the National Corporation for Electricity of Ecuador and they are looking into issues of energy efficiency. Entonces, eh, de lo que estaba viendo, obviamente la energía provee mu a muchos sectores. ¿Cómo nosotros podemos ser... Eh, o sea, más eficientes en cuanto a la distribución, porque he visto, por ejemplo, aquí en, en Alemania, eh, me he dedicado a estar viendo por el centro cómo están eh, las redes eléctricas, cómo están distribuidas, y cómo también se maneja el tema de la electricidad en las casas o los edificios y los hoteles. ¿Cómo nosotros como Latinoamérica podemos implementar en los países que están en, en desarrollo una eficiencia energética eh, guiada a... Eh, los desafíos de, de, de la lucha contra el cambio climático. Eso. Well, she's been doing field work uh, while attending the, the COP. She's been looking around in, uh, in, in, in Bonn about the distribution of electricity and the use of uh, uh, electricity in houses. And uh, she wonders what, uh, what is that uh, Uh, Ecuador and Latin American countries can do in this very important item of energy efficiency. Okay. Yes, that, that is my question for, eh, no sé, por cual, para cualquiera. I'm sure some, uh, uh, more than one will pick it up. <laughs> the gentleman on the back, please. Hello, um, my name is Bernice. I'm from the Nicaragua Alliance on Climate Change. And uh, my question will be how the idea is to make a faster transition from uh, um, uh, countries that are really related in cold and uh, dirty energy to clean energy. What's the uh, regulations and tax law are are playing in this and if you could give me some examples. I say this because we have in, in my country we have a really fast transition to clean energy and uh, what we did is that we put a law that we say that um, there will be free taxes for 10 years who everyone that invests in clean energy. So we attract a lot of investors and the transition was really fast. Now we are 52% in clean energy and our goal is to be 90% in 2020. So I want to hear ideas of how countries that are really related in dirty energy could make this transition during tax law and regulation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, Nicaragua is one of the countries in which we are working. And uh, so I knew I was missing one, <laughs> at least. Any other questions? Well, I think uh, what then what we can do, we will go on the reverse order. The questions, I think, are general enough uh, for everyone to motivate further comments based on their particular perspective. So, uh, Amparo, please. Uh, well, okay. In uh, they, they will ask uh, uh, Mike will ask about, about the, the CLUES uh, material of uh, educational. But what, what I can uh, say is that uh, the one of, of the of the main main uh, materials that that we saw is uh, that kind of workshops uh, that are training. To, uh, that are that are enhancing capacity uh, in into the, the the countries about the use of of models and the uh, the data management. Uh, but uh, to the to the question about the uh, efficiency and uh, energy efficiency, well, I, I think that that there are a, a lot of experiences that the countries uh, the South South Cooperation. Could uh, could uh, allow to to see and to to uh, 
to walk uh, a, a, a little a little fast because we had similar situations and uh, I think that now is a very good uh, a period where we are experiencing uh, a lot of different options. I think that uh, in the first place in Mexico, for example, we have a, a very um, very uh, strong program about uh, about uh, efficiency energy uh, efficiency in, in in general in all the in all the the, the items of the energy uses but uh, also we are exploring a very very deep very deep the renewable renewable energies the solar energies uh, this is, is the same well I, I I think that if you are if you are here if your country is here there are a lot of commitments a lot of experiences that are uh, changing and what we have to do is to to walk <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Amparo. Uh, then, if I remember correctly, we go to Simon. Uh, Simon? Okay, let me offer two sets of comments. Um, first, in terms of uh, educational tools, um, IASA uh, offers um, a young summer student's program where students in their PhD, usually latterly in their PhD, come to Luxembourg uh, for 12 weeks uh, during the summer. The summer school is about 40 to 60 PhD students and they get opportunities to work on our energy models, to work on our environmental models, our water models uh, and the methods. We also offer two-year postdoctoral uh, fellowships uh, largely to our, our country members. I would say that our models uh, and data are largely uh, open source. They are available on our website. And in terms of more resources, there's obviously all of the publications and all of the briefs. And maybe I, I can give you my card afterwards, or I would encourage you to look at our website, which is www.iasa.ac.at. Um, the other two questions about uh, energy and efficiency and transfer to clean energy, my, my comments there would be, you know, quite often we think about the resource side. So we're thinking about creating more of a resource. And equally, I would say that it's really important to think about the demand side. I mean, you essentially, you have three options. You create a bigger resource pool so we can use more, or we can reduce our demand. And I think if you combine those two, and then the third element is to trade. So I think don't just think about the resource generation, but the opportunities to reduce or make the demand more efficient, as well as the supply more efficient and greater. And then the third element is where are there opportunities uh, to trade. So I think that's what I would offer quickly. Thank you very much. Uh, well, then we we come to Tobias, please. Yes, thank you. Um, concerning faster transition, yeah, of course, I'm coming from a now with my, my, my German head from a country which is just in the process of transition very fast. Also, a law helps helps very much, as you said. We have have a national law in Germany then to to force this this transition. You need to have a partnership, of course, between government and industry, and so that's also what we built in Germany, so that they, have a, that they see also the opportunities in, in this change, because in one energy sector, like we, we have heavily built on coal and atom nuclear power in the past, and still are, but reduced now a lot, um, but now we have to create a very new and, uh, and business jobs now, opportunities in the renewable energy sector. We have now, uh, I think, a uh, Number of, during the last few months, we were never less than 55% of energy production from renewables, and the highest number I've seen was 70%. So, and this created a lot of jobs, and also more jobs than jobs which has been have been lost already in, in the in the old energy sectors like like nuclear or coal. So, yeah, it's a, it's a transition, but it, you need to you need to have a 
the, the players in the boat, so the, the governmental side with the, with the laws or with the powers or with the, yeah, with the mandate, but of course on the other side uh, the, the business. And then it, it can work and of course, yeah, then you could also always talk to us and try to learn and from not only from Germany, there's other countries as well and who did it already and, and are positive examples. Uh, concerning efficiency, well, also with my German hat, maybe this is a German issue, then um, we have a lot of rules and regulations and I think we have to talk about standardization also then. I think this is, this is very important and there's activities on the global level of the ISO, International Standardization Organization, they can of course help them to improve efficiency and there's, a, there's regional levels in the different continents and there's also national levels and I think you have to bring energy production and also in our case also the climate change issues also into, into these um, areas, these sectors and, and, and that, that can help then as long as there are standards and rules and regulations, maybe it's in Germany more than in other countries but that's how we are, <laughs> um, that helps of course then, then that, that things work. <laughs> Not, not always nice because we have we are forced sometimes to do things and not always in a nice way but yeah then that's the, yeah, the efficient way of course yeah that, that's that's one of the bases also for that yeah uh, the last point education and training yeah i do not i'm not familiar if unesco is already a member of the global framework for climate services i presented but i would encourage uh, unesco to consider to to participate and to to make a contact with the world meteorological organization and find a way because we also we address in, in gfcs what i presented at the beginning of course communication and education and training aspects and i think it would be very beneficial if, if unesco then would uh, share some some information and some ways to do and we could join also some our activities uh, in order then to to uh, bring forward and the, 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 the increase also of renewable energies and, and and so i think yeah both sides could 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 uh, benefit from that thank you very much tobias uh, then mark please to um, start off by um, focusing a little bit on the, the, the teaching and, and, and sewing. So um, the thing is we'd, we'd be very, very keen to partner. What we're trying to do with this large group of folk, and this activity is being led by Cambridge University, is to develop a set of curricula that can be nice, clear, clean modules that can be put into distance learning uh, material that people can adopt and adapt. We, we, um, we're using a little metaphor where we say that it, they should be skeletal and modular so that people can take the bits, that, the bones that they want and flesh them out to the, to the local context and so on. So we're working on this. We um, have an annual summer school that's been set up together with UNDESA at a place called the ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, in Italy and uh, trying to develop a international master's degree where we can take um, key bits of curricula that help people understand land use, water use, energy use and the models and so on that uh, are used uh, to try and try and analyze those and then bring those into policy. It's also the case that um, so we see energy as a key entry point. Obviously, energy is not everything, but uh, we're setting up, and we'd be very keen to partner on this too, we're setting up global, what we're calling energy modeling platforms, where um, uh, there'll be one in Africa held in January, there'll be in, uh, Latin, uh, in South, South, South and Central America, uh, Asia Pacific and others, places where uh, people can go along, get access to free material, uh, best in class, uh, data and so on, open reviewed models, a as well as uh, uh, get some training and so on that they can use and go take back to, to country and have a space where they can come along and present what it is that they're, they're doing. As Eduardo correctly points out, you know, a lot of the expertise, pe the, the understanding of the problems on the ground are just going to be better in uh, in country from experts in those countries, but to kind of create community and improve the um, and, and share the level of knowledge, I think would be very very valuable. So you know, any anything from um, the the summer schools partnering with the summer schools, helping to develop this international uh, masters curricula, which can be adopted and adapted. These energy modeling platforms, um, as I said, there's a scientific session that we put up where we want to try and get developing country scientists. Uh, to come along and participate uh, more, those kinds of things would be uh, useful. Another thing just to mention, and, and much like uh, IASA, who we're partnering with us, uh, 
effort is our tools are all open source so they can be downloaded and there are a number of universities that are starting to uh, pick them up uh, and use them and I think you know creating a, a safe environment where it's easy for people to connect in these communities is uh, is something that I think will have a very big impact but it's not something that you see happening a lot it's not as though people are encouraged to go along and join uh, different different communities um, maybe just the, the other thing that I want to uh, point out, two, two other things. One is, is that we're partnering with Google, World Resources Institute, and a few others to develop really good quality data that everybody can pick up and get access to easily. And somehow, I think that will be important uh, in the future. The other is, is that this is a long-term effort. If we, if we look around and we think about places where good integrated analysis takes place, for sure, it has to happen in government. We need people in government who at least understand how these things fit together. But um, often these skills kind of fit together quite naturally in a, a national planning institute or in a university or in an, uh, a, 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 an academic institute and so on. So this idea of trying to build up long-term skills in a university setting I think is uh, uh, not the answer, but certainly part of the answer, and somehow uh, doing that well, I think, is key. I just want to come to energy efficiency. So, I mean, I, I, I live in Sweden, but I had the privilege of spending part of my life in, 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 in sunny South Africa, and I'm guessing that Ecuador is a little bit more sunny than Bonn is right now. And it's very interesting because energy efficiency directives and so on are different in different places. Often in the Northern Hemisphere, there's a focus on heating uh, and so on uh, around that and thermal insulation standards. In South Africa, and I would imagine that maybe there are some similarities, we set up a national energy efficiency program where, where the first step was to not talk about energy efficiency per se, for sure, understand where you could be more efficient, but translate all of these into investment opportunities. We rebranded the program Energy Efficiency Earnings and went along to a bunch of the gold mines and others. These gold mines, they dig a couple of kilometers into the ground, use massive amounts of energy. And they were really surprised to see that um, actually a lot of the um, a lot of these energy efficiency options made economic sense, made financial sense for them but it had just never been interpreted in that way. And I think maybe there's an interesting uh, space to get more information in a way that uh, helps uh, the, the heavy users of, uh, of energy. I could go on, but I see that Eduardo is looking at me nervously, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. Let me just um, add to what has been said. Uh, in, so in maybe several of the... In perhaps uh, almost half of the countries in which these integrated assessment capacity development programs are taking place, the issue of energy efficiency comes up immediately. And sometimes linked to the point of how to do a fast transition from dirty to clean energy or to renewable energy. In some cases, the, the modeling says that you cannot go above uh, half of the target that, for example, environment ministries would like to have in terms of renewables. But if uh, the modeling can also show that if you do the proper efficiency uh, policies, you don't need to push that hard on the supply side and you can still achieve the energy services uh, that you need with a lower cost and, uh, and with the clean uh, mandate there. So that's, a, that's ex an extremely important issue. Education, uh, I was uh, very surprised to read a few weeks ago, I think, uh, from the chief uh, climate change modeler from uh, Oxford, Oxford University, saying that he had spent 15 years uh, trying to make uh, all these very complex models and then he spent 10 years trying to explain that these were really simple models and uh, that you could do policy based on those. Yeah, in, in the projects that, uh, that we do, we do put an emphasis on communication. Uh, in, it's, it's complex, might be complex, might be difficult, might be time consuming, but, has, but at the end it's really simple messages and simple ideas that uh, are, re are driven the modeling. But that's not enough. That's the supply side, communicating well. You also have to educate the demand side. 
Uh, and for that, the educational materials that are put forward are extremely important. It's not only that you create a model that is relevant for the country, really driven by the country, by the interests, by the ideas of the country. It's not only that you communicate correctly the, the results, it's also that people can understand you. And to that, you need education and materials. In, in, in all of these projects, we are also putting some emphasis on dissemination training uh, materials, and we are going to have something coming up uh, soon uh, by uh, UNDESA, IEA, and UNDP. Okay. Well, uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, if there are uh, other questions, uh, we can also um, uh, pull a little bit more of, uh, uh, from our uh, speakers. You want to you wanna add something? Yeah, if, if I may, just while people are putting their hands up slowly. Um, th the other thing is, is I think there's also a little bit of a change in the way we, we need to do education and um, uh, connect with folk as well. So I, I mentioned this case, this thing about energy efficiency earnings and so on. But we also kind of need to understand um, that when we do this stuff, we have to be able to talk finance. It's only fairly recently, I would argue, that when we look at carbon mitigation options or even um, um, water interventions or a bunch of other things, it's only fairly recently that those have moved out of the domain of a particular type of policymaker into numbers that the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, others can actually understand and then be able to move into a financing product. product. The, the little example that I gave of uh, India and Punjab, for example, it's the case that the um, irrigation equipment that would be required to drastically reduce the amount of water that is needed. If you were to map that back to how much carbon dioxide you save, because you're not having to generate that much electricity, as a climate investment, this is just gold. It's a very small amount of money for a huge amount of CO2 reduction. And yet we've not, we, we still need to go that extra step to try and understand um, how to frame a lot of, we're do, of what we're doing into sensible investment readiness stuff. The same goes for technology development. You know, you go to most universities and you'll be talking, you know, or you go to a university in Europe and it's very sexy right now to study renewable energy. This is something that we're into and maybe smart grids and so on. However, again, if you were to go back to different, different cases, um, we look at some of the innovation that's happening in um, areas like the Northwest Saharan Aquifer and others where people are drawing water out of the ground to do irrigation. You find that you can deploy renewable energy far cheaper when you're doing things like desalination and uh, irrigation because you can use the energy when it's available. You don't need to have batteries or storage or all kinds of other things that are causing huge constraints in the German electricity system. So again, there are a lot of opportunities for technology development, but we don't necessarily go back and challenge our technology developers in this particular way. And then lastly, there's, um, when we think about institutions and policy, I, I'm, I'm making fun of bad Germany's bad weather and uh, transmission congestion right now, but we did uh, some work for one of VW's largest manufacturing plants and went through the plant, very, very clever engineer. I came back with my report and said, you know, this is where I think you can reduce your energy consumption. He said, yeah, yeah, not bad. But there are lots of other places too, and he wrote them down for me, and I was like, okay, fine, <laughs> all right, so this is what you could do. And then, then he told me, listen, you know, love what you're doing, it's all a great idea, but you're going to have to recommend to upper management that we change our key performance indicators, because this report, it will go somewhere, I'll get another engineer, my key performance indicator is production, so as soon as there's a production problem, I don't care about energy efficiency anymore, he's going to come into my production team. But if you make a key performance indicator, the amount of CO2 per car that you produce, or the amount of energy used per car that you produce, we can justify this guy and a team around him or her to um, change the way things are done. And I think that there's a lot of space to do really new, interesting work in the way we organize our institutions, from um, uh, the end user through to, through to governments. So I think in those three areas, there's, there's 
We, we, we need to talk not just about capacity building, but also developing new knowledge, how to move things into good financing information, technology challenges for our, our budding enge engineers, and then uh, new institutional uh, frameworks and understandings. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, just a follow-up, if I dare, on the leading author of the original Clues uh, article, Mark, um, to remind of the interlinkages. Uh, if we do too much uh, and too cheap uh, solar energy for water extraction, we might uh, end up with no aquifers. Uh, and that's a uh, unique integrated assessment. Even if it, you, can, you can push for a very efficient and very low cost, clean uh, alternative to provide water for irrigation, you have to be clear or how much water you can use in the total. Uh, so that's uh, just to, to call back the attention to into integrated assessment. Questions, please? Here. Did you hear back the question on the back? No. no. Okay. The question is how you, uh, with this uh, scheme that you have to produce the integrated assessment, how you manage or how you work around about the huge amount of data that is placed in, in a diverse uh, environment to come out with this type of analysis. That was the question? Yes. Yeah, yes. There are other questions. Uh, other questions? Okay, Amparo. Well, f first of all, uh, we we uh, had to understand very very well that um, a model is only a, a broad indicator of of some things that are that are running at, at the same time, at that uh, we we have to to have a much more uh, skills or instruments. To, to 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 decisions, but the the integrated um, management is uh, it was very useful because uh, sometimes, as uh, uh, and the example that that Eduardo uh, gave now about the quantity of water in some region and the 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 use or the effort in terms to to uh, uh, extract the water in in in, another, in the same place uh, we we have to to in the first place to uh, evaluate to assess what are the quality of the data i think that the first challenge was to to see how are the quality of the data and uh, where we can compare a uh, among one state, the another, but also that we have a different quality of data in each of the sectors. In one sector, we have much more uh, data and with a with a time set uh, more wide, uh, as as in the meteorological I I issues. But there are uh, another in some of energy, some of agriculture, that we have uh, the, the data more uh, dispersed or with not so a uh, validation. And uh, I think that the, the, the first challenge is uh, to detect what we need to know. And uh, uh, therefore, when, when we know what we need to know, we we know what what we have and what we can do with that and the the clues was very was very useful in that in that sense because uh, we put uh, together all the data that uh, that we that we uh, uh, know and we were a uh, discussing with the with the experts and with the stakeholders after that when we have that uh, big picture and uh, we have to to detect the 
the annoyances that that the information uh, can 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 give us, and I, I think that uh, you you need uh, a, a lot of, of different activities at the same time uh, uh, to to manage the the data and to to build the the, the policies. Uh, uh, of course, we is, this is an instrument to that that put us in a in a good way. To, to do that, uh, but the challenges come from the input and it's, it's the input to the output. <laughs> what do you Thank you very much. Okay, well, we have only four minutes left. Uh, I'm uh, give one minute each to to give uh, concluding remarks and I'll follow the same order as we start. Mark. I think I've said all I've wanted to, to say, Eduardo, just to uh, extend that invitation to uh, folk to join these communities of practice and to take part in uh, these uh, relatively exciting activities that are, that are being set up. I think it's a beautiful challenge that's up ahead of us, and if we don't rise to it, I think we'll, we'll find ourselves in difficult times in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Tobias? Well, I could also follow up from the context of the Global Framework for Climate Services. I also encourage everybody to have a look what we are doing in the methodological world, in, in, in the climate services world. And I think we could benefit from it. This is an open activity, so it's open for everybody, for all different institutions. And so I invite you also to have a closer look and then to find a way maybe how you can link them to this activity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tobias. Is Simon? Gosh, what do you say? I mean, what I would say is, is please consider this uh, integrated uh, approach between sectors, between issues. Um, it's just so important. And I think quite often the problems are identified by researchers, but it's equally important to understand from the demand side and, and the users. If you're trying to influence policy and practice, and particularly bringing investors uh, on board as part of those solutions. And that's the other thing is, I think we're quite well advanced on the diagnostics. We know where we are, we know where we want to get to, but it's really those pathways and how those pathways differ by communities, by industries, by sectors, and, and by countries. So it's that solution pathway which is fundamental to me, which I don't think there is a good grip of and I don't believe there's enough emphasis being given to those solution pathways uh, at the moment. We've got the targets and we know we are. In between them, we don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Amparo? I only want to, to add that I, I absolutely agree with the colleague of, of, of Yasa. And, but, but I think that, that I, I, integration, uh, obviously, sounds like a very complex and in, indeed it is, but it is necessary to, that, that, uh, it to be at the same time with coordination, with enhancing coordination uh, uh, among sectors and a uh, very important to uh, the, the participation of the communities of, uh, of that. Uh, Education, everything uh, is uh, finishing with Asian, but <laughs> is is very is, is is very important also, uh, because if if you uh, can't make the can reach the participation on all the sectors that that are uh, working in a community, is uh, very difficult to change the demand the the offer. Uh, and well, that that is coordination and integration. I think that is important. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, the the main idea is that this uh, the work needs to be uh, the diagnosis has to be gone to countries. This has to be owned by uh, by governments. It has to be implemented by. Uh, technical analyst in governments. It has to be uh, born from the uh, government interest uh, and uh, should communicate its uh, results effectively and should rely on networks, as uh, Mark uh, has pointed out. With this, it's 14.30, and I want to thank everyone for uh, their interest and for participating in this uh, uh, side event. And I want to ask you to join me in uh, 
thanking the panel for very insightful presentations. Thank you very much.